Brought to you by WikiVD Documentaries. Labour Party, UK. The Labour Party is a centre-left political party in the United Kingdom. Growing out of the trade union movement and socialist parties of the 19th century, the Labour Party has been described as a broad church, encompassing a diversity of ideological trends from strongly socialist to moderately social democratic. Founded in 1900, the Labour Party overtook the Liberal Party as the main opposition to the Conservative Party in the early 1920s, forming minority governments under Ramsay MacDonald in 1924 and from 1929 to 1931. Labour later served in the wartime coalition from 1940 to 1945, after which it formed a majority government under Clement Attlee. Labour was also in government from 1964 to 1970 under Harold Wilson and from 1974 to 1979, first under Wilson and then James Callaghan. The Labour Party was last in government from 1997 to 2010 under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, beginning with a landslide majority of 179, reduced to 167 in 2001 and 66 in 2005, having won 262 seats at the 2017 general election. The party is the official opposition in the Parliament of the United Kingdom. The Labour Party is the largest party in the Welsh Assembly, the third largest party in the Scottish Parliament and has 20 MEPs in the European Parliament. Sitting in the Socialists and Democrats group, the party also organises in Northern Ireland, but does not contest elections to the Northern Ireland Assembly. The Labour Party is a full member of the Party of European Socialists and Progressive Alliance and holds observer status in the Socialist International. In September 2015, Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party. Founding The Labour Party originated in the late 19th century, when it became apparent that there was a need for a new political party to represent the interests and needs of the urban proletariat, a demographic which had increased in number and had recently been given franchise. Some members of the trades union movement became interested in moving into the political field, and after further extensions of the voting franchise in 1867 and 1885, the Liberal Party endorsed some trade union-sponsored candidates. The first LibLab candidate to stand was George Odger in the Southwark by election of 1870. In addition, several small socialist groups had formed around this time, with the intention of linking the movement to political policies. Among these were the Independent Labour Party, the Intellectual and Largely Middle Class Fabian Society, the Marxist Social Democratic Federation, and the Scottish Labour Party. At the 1895 general election, the Independent Labour Party put up 28 candidates, but won only 44,325 votes. Keir Hardy the leader of the party believed that to obtain success in parliamentary elections, it would be necessary to join with other left-wing groups. Hardy's roots as a lay preacher contributed to an ethos in the party which led to the comment by 1950s General Secretary Morgan Phillips that socialism in Britain owed more to Methodism than Marx. Labour Representation Committee. In 1899, a Doncaster member of the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, Thomas R. Steeles, proposed in his union branch that the Trade Union Congress call a special conference to bring together all left wing organisations and form them into a single body that would sponsor parliamentary candidates. The motion was passed at all stages by the Tuck, and the proposed conference was held 
at the Memorial Hall on Farringdon Street on 26 and 27 February 1900. The meeting was attended by a broad spectrum of working class and left-wing organizations. Trades unions represented about one-third of the membership of the Tuck delegates. After a debate, the 129 delegates passed Hardy's motion to establish a distinct labor group in Parliament, who shall have their own whips and agree upon their policy, which must embrace a readiness to cooperate with any party which, for the time being, may be engaged in promoting legislation in the direct interests of labor. This created an association called the Labor Representation Committee, meant to coordinate attempts to support MPs sponsored by trade unions and represent the working-class population. It had no single leader, and in the absence of one, the independent Labour Party nominee Ramsay MacDonald was elected as secretary. He had the difficult task of keeping the various strands of opinions in the LRC united. The October the 1900 Khaki election came too soon for the new party to campaign effectively. Total expenses for the election only came to £33. Only 15 candidatures were sponsored, but two were successful. Keir Hardy in Merthyr Tydfil and Richard Bell in Derby. Support for the LRC was boosted by the 1901 Taff Vale case, a dispute between strikers and a railway company that ended with the union being ordered to pay £23,000 damages for a strike. The judgment effectively made strikes illegal, since employers could recoup the cost of lost business from the unions. The apparent acquiescence of the Conservative government of Arthur Balfour to industrial and business interest intensified support for the LRC against a government that appeared to have little concern for the industrial proletariat and its problems. In the 1906 election, the LRC won 29 seats, helped by a secret 1903 pact between Ramsay MacDonald and Liberal Chief Whip Herbert Gladstone that aimed to avoid splitting the opposition vote between Labour and Liberal candidates in the interest of removing the Conservatives from office. In their first meeting after the election the group's members of parliament decided to adopt the name, the Labour Party, formerly Keir Hardy, who had taken a leading role in getting the party established, was elected as chairman of the parliamentary Labour Party, although only by one vote, over David Shackleton after several ballots. In the party's early years, the Independent Labour Party provided much of its activist base as the party did not have individual membership until 1918, but operated as a conglomerate of affiliated bodies. The Fabian Society provided much of the intellectual stimulus for the party. One of the first acts of the new Liberal government was to reverse the Taffail judgment. The People's History Museum in Manchester holds the minutes of the first Labour Party meeting in 1906 and has them on display in the main galleries. Also within the museum is the Labour History Archive and Study Centre, which holds the collection of the Labour Party, with material ranging from 1900 to the present day. Early Years the 1910 election saw 42 Labour MPs elected to the House of Commons, a significant victory since a year before the election. The House of Lords had passed the Osborne Judgment ruling that trades unions in the United Kingdom could no longer donate money to fund the election campaigns and wages of Labour MPs. Governing Liberals were unwilling to repeal this judicial decision with primary legislation. The height of Liberal compromise was to introduce a wage for members of Parliament to remove the need to involve the trade unions. By 1913, faced with the opposition of the largest trades unions, the Liberal government passed the Trade Disputes Act to allow trade unions to fund Labour MPs once more. 
During the First World War the Labour Party split between supporters and opponents of the conflict, but opposition to the war grew within the party as time went on. Ramsay MacDonald, a notable anti-war campaigner, resigned as leader of the Parliamentary Labour Party, and Arthur Henderson became the main figure of authority within the party. He was soon accepted into Prime Minister Asker's war cabinet, becoming the first Labour Party member to serve in government. Despite mainstream Labour Party's support for the coalition, the Independent Labour Party was instrumental in opposing conscription through organisations such as the Non-Conscription Fellowship while a Labour Party affiliate. The British Socialist Party organised a number of unofficial strikes. Arthur Henderson resigned from the cabinet in 1917 amid calls for party unity to be replaced by George Barnes. The growth in Labour's local activist base and organisation was reflected in the elections following the war, the cooperative movement now providing its own resources to the cooperative party after the armistice. The cooperative party later reached an electoral agreement with the Labour Party. Henderson turned his attention to building a strong constituency-based support network for the Labour Party. Previously, it had little national organization, based largely on branches of unions and socialist societies. Working with Ramsay MacDonald and Sidney Webb, Henderson in 1918 established a national network of constituency organizations. They operated separately from trade unions and the National Executive Committee and were open to everyone sympathetic to the party's policies. Secondly, Henderson secured the adoption of a comprehensive statement of party policies, as drafted by Sidney Webb, entitled, Labour, and the New Social Order. It remained the basic Labour platform until 1950. It proclaimed a socialist party whose principalists included a guaranteed minimum standard of living for everyone, nationalization of industry, and heavy taxation of large incomes and of wealth. It was in 1918 that Clause IV, as drafted by Sidney Webb, was adopted into Labour's constitution, committing the party to work towards the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. With the representation of the People Act 1918, almost all adult men and most women over the age of 30 were given the right to vote, almost tripling the British electorate at a stroke, from 7.7 .7 million in 1912 to 21.4 million in 1918. This set the scene for a surge in Labour representation in Parliament. The Communist Party of Great Britain was refused affiliation to the Labour Party between 1921 and 1923. Meanwhile, the Liberal Party declined rapidly, and the party also suffered a catastrophic split which allowed the Labour Party to gain much of the Liberals' support. With the Liberals thus in disarray, Labour won 142 seats in 1922, making it the second-largest political group in the House of Commons, and the official opposition to the Conservative government. After the election Ramsay MacDonald was voted the first official leader of the Labour Party. First Labour Government, 1924 The 1923 general election was fought on the Conservatives' protectionist proposals but, although they got the most votes and remained the largest party, they lost their majority in Parliament necessitating the formation of a government supporting free trade. Thus, with the acquiescence of Ascus liberals, Ramsay MacDonald became the first ever Labour Prime Minister in January 1924, forming the first Labour government, despite Labour only having 191 MPs. Because the government had to rely on the support of the liberals it was unable to get any socialist legislation passed by the House of Commons. The only significant measure was the Wheatley Housing Act, 
which began a building program of 500,000 homes for rental to working-class families. Legislation on education, unemployment and social insurance were also passed. While there were no major labor strikes during his term, MacDonald acted swiftly to end those that did erupt. When the Labour Party executive criticized the government, he replied that, public doles, popularism, local defiance of the national government, strikes for increased wages, limitation of output, not only are not socialism, but may mislead the spirit and policy of the socialist movement. The government collapsed after only nine months. When the Liberals voted for a select committee inquiry into the Campbell case, a vote which MacDonald had declared to be a vote of confidence, the ensuing 1924 general election saw the publication, four days before polling day, of Bazinoviev letter, in which Moscow talked about a communist revolution in Britain. The letter had little impact on the Labour vote, which held up. It was the collapse of the Liberal Party that led to the Conservative landslide. The Conservatives were returned to power although Labour increased its vote from 30.7% to a third of the popular vote, most Conservative gains being at the expense of the Liberals. However many Labourites for years blamed their defeat on foul play, thereby according to AJP. Taylor misunderstanding the political forces at work and delaying needed reforms in the party. In opposition MacDonald continued his policy of presenting the Labour Party as a moderate force. During the general strike of 1926 the party opposed the general strike, arguing that the best way to achieve social reforms was through the ballot box. The leaders were also fearful of communist influence orchestrated from Moscow. The party had a distinctive and suspicious foreign policy based on pacifism. Its leaders believed that peace was impossible, because of capitalism, secret diplomacy, and the trade in armaments. That is it stressed material factors that ignored the psychological memories of the Great War and the highly emotional tensions regarding nationalism and the boundaries of the countries. Second Labour Government, 1929-1931 In the 1929 general election, the Labour Party became the largest in the House of Commons. For the first time, with 287 seats and 37.1% of the popular vote, However MacDonald was still reliant on liberal support to form a minority government. MacDonald went on to appoint Britain's first female cabinet minister, Margaret Bondfield, who was appointed Minister of Labour. The government, however, soon found itself engulfed in crisis, the Wall Street crash of 1929, and eventually Great Depression occurred soon after the government came to power and the crisis hit Britain hard. By the end of 1930 unemployment had doubled to over two and a half million. The government had no effective answers to the crisis. By the summer of 1931 the dispute focused over whether or not to reduce unemployment compensation. New York bankers had provided an emergency loans. More loans required deep spending cuts and the Labour cabinet was split nearly in half. The financial crisis grew worse, and decisive government action was needed as the leaders of both the Conservative and Liberal parties met with King George V and Macdonald, at first to discuss support for the spending cuts, but later to discuss the shape of the next government. The king played a central role in demanding a national government be formed. On 24 August, MacDonald agreed and formed a national government composed of men from all parties, with the specific aim of balancing the budget and restoring confidence. The new cabinet had four laborers who stood with MacDonald, plus four conservatives and two liberals. MacDonald's moves aroused great anger among a large majority of Labour Party activists who felt 
betrayed. Labor unions were strongly opposed, and the Labor Party officially repudiated the new national government. It expelled MacDonald and made Henderson the leader of the main Labor Party. Henderson led it into the general election on 27 October against the three-party national coalition. It was a disaster for Labour, which was reduced to a small minority of 52. MacDonald won the largest landslide in British political history. In 1931 Labour campaigned on opposition to public spending cuts, but found it difficult to defend the record of the party's former government, and the fact that most of the cuts had been agreed before it fell. Historian Andrew Thorpe argues that Labour lost credibility by 1931 as unemployment soared, especially in coal, textiles, shipbuilding, and steel. The working class increasingly lost confidence in the ability of Labour to solve the most pressing problem. The 2.5 million Irish Catholics in England and Scotland were a major factor in the labour base in many industrial areas. The Catholic Church had previously tolerated the Labour Party and denied that it represented true socialism. However, the bishops, by 1930, had grown increasingly alarmed at Labour's policies toward communist Russia toward birth control and especially toward funding Catholic schools. They warned its members. The Catholic shift against Labour and in favour of the national government played a major role in Labour's losses. 1930s split Arthur Henderson, elected in 1931 to succeed MacDonald, lost his seat in the 1931 general election. The only former Labour cabinet member who had retained his seat, the pacifist George Lansbury, accordingly became party leader. The party experienced another split in 1932, when the independent Labour Party, which for some years had been increasingly at odds with the Labour leadership, opted to disaffiliate from the Labour Party and embarked on a long drawn-out decline. Lansbury resigned as leader in 1935 after public disagreements over foreign policy. He was promptly replaced as leader by his deputy, Clement Attlee, who would lead the party for two decades. The party experienced a revival in the 1935 general election, winning 154 seats and 38% of the popular vote, the highest that Labour had achieved. As the threat from Nazi Germany increased, in the late 1930s the Labour Party gradually abandoned its pacifist stance and supported rearmament, largely due to the efforts of Ernest Bevan and Hugh Dalton who, by 1937 had also persuaded the party to oppose Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement wartime coalition, 1940-1945. The party returned to government in 1940 as part of the wartime coalition. When Neville Chamberlain resigned in the spring of 1940, incoming Prime Minister Winston Churchill decided to bring the other main parties into a coalition similar to that of the First World War. Clement Attlee was appointed Lord Privy Seal and a member of the War Cabinet, eventually becoming the United Kingdom's first Deputy Prime Minister. A number of other senior Labour figures also took up senior positions. The trade union leader, Ernest Bevan, as Minister of Labour, directed Britain's wartime economy and allocation of manpower. The veteran Labour statesman Herbert Morrison became Home Secretary. Hugh Dalton was Minister of Economic Warfare and later President of the Board of Trade, while A. V. Alexander resumed the role he had held in the previous Labour government as First Lord of the Admiralty. Attlee Government, 1945-1951 at the end of the war in Europe, in May 1945, Labour resolved not 
to repeat the Liberals' era of 1918, and promptly withdrew from government on trade union insistence to contest the 1945 general election in opposition to Churchill's Conservatives. Surprising many observers, Labour won a formidable victory, winning just under 50% of the vote with a majority of 159 seats. Although Clement Attlee was no great radical himself, Attlee's government proved one of the most radical British governments of the 20th century. Enacting Keynesian economic policies, presiding over a policy of nationalizing major industries and utilities, including the Bank of England, coal mining, the steel industry, electricity, gas, and inland transport. It developed and implemented the cradle-to-grave welfare state conceived by the economist William Beveridge. To this day, most people in the United Kingdom see the 1948 creation of Britain's publicly funded national health service under Health Minister Aniron Bevan as Labour's proudest achievement. Attlee's government also began the process of dismantling the British Empire when it granted independence to India and Pakistan in 1947, followed by Burma and Ceylon the following year. At a secret meeting in January 1947, Attlee and six cabinet ministers, including Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan, decided to proceed with the development of Britain's nuclear weapons program, in opposition to the pacifist and anti-nuclear stances of a large element inside the Labour Party. Labour went on to win the 1950 general election, but with a much reduced majority of five seats. Soon afterwards, defence became a divisive issue within the party, especially defence spending, straining public finances and forcing savings elsewhere. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Hugh Gateskill, introduced charges for NHS dentures and spectacles, causing Bevan, along with Harold Wilson, to resign. Over the dilution of the principle of free treatment on which the NHS had been established. In the 1951 general election, Labour narrowly lost to Churchill's Conservatives. Despite receiving the larger share of the popular vote, its highest ever vote numerically. Most of the changes introduced by the 1945-51 Labour government were accepted by the Conservatives and became part of the post-war consensus that lasted until the late 1970s. Food and clothing rationing, however, still in place since the war, were swiftly relaxed, then abandoned from about 1953. Post-war consensus, 1951-1964 Following the defeat of 1951 the party spent 13 years in opposition. The party suffered an ideological split, while the post-war economic recovery and the social effects of Attlee's reforms made the public broadly content with the conservative governments of the time. Attlee remained as leader until his retirement in 1955. His replacement, Hugh Gateskill, associated with the right wing of the party, struggled in dealing with internal party divisions in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and Labour lost the 1959 general election. In 1963, Gates calls sudden death from a heart attack made way for Harold Wilson to lead the party. Wilson Government, 1964-1970 A downturn in the economy and a series of scandals in the early 1960s had engulfed the Conservative government by 1963. The Labour Party returned to government with a four-seat majority under Wilson in the 1964 general election, but increased its majority to 96 in the 1966 general election. Wilson's government was responsible for a number of sweeping social and educational reforms under the leadership of Home Secretary Roy Jenkins such as the abolishment 
of the death penalty in 1964, the legalization of abortion and homosexuality in 1967, and the abolition of theater censorship in 1968. Comprehensive education was expanded, and the open university created. However Wilson's government had inherited a large trade deficit that led to a currency crisis, and ultimately a doomed attempt to stave off devaluation of the pound. Labour went on to lose the 1970 general election to the Conservatives under Edward Heath. Spell in opposition, 1970-1974 after losing the 1970 general election, Labour returned to opposition, but retained Harold Wilson as leader. Heath's government soon ran into trouble over Northern Ireland, and a dispute with miners in 1973 which led to the three-day week. The 1970s proved a difficult time to be in government for both the Conservatives and Labour due to the 1973 oil crisis which caused high inflation and a global recession. The Labour Party was returned to power again under Wilson a few weeks after the February 1974 general election, forming a minority government with the support of the Ulster Unionists. The Conservatives were unable to form a government alone as they had fewer seats despite receiving more votes numerically. It was the first general election since 1924 in which both main parties had received less than 40% of the popular vote, and the first of six successive general elections in which Labour failed to reach 40% of the popular vote. In a bid to gain a majority, a second election was soon called for October 1974 in which Labour, still with Harold Wilson as leader, won a slim majority of three, gaining just 18 seats taking its total to 319. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.